Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining another Wednesday Easy Chair Chat. It's said that Richmond is one of the worst cities in America for pollen, and I can tell you I'm really dealing with it right now this week, so hopefully I won't be coughing and you, you can bear with me here. Uh, some, a storm washed a bunch of starfish up on the beach, and a little girl was throwing them one by one back into the ocean. <clears throat> and a man who was jogging along the beach stopped and uh, found out what she was doing. She said she was throwing them back in, and she said, well, there's so many of them, it's not going to make a difference. <clears throat> she threw one back in and said, it made a difference for that one. And so that's how I think we want to view our lives. We want to make a difference, have influence. <clears throat> in the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm going through, we're now past the Beatitudes, and in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, it's going to be my text the next few weeks. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. In this text, Jesus uses two metaphors to describe influence, salt and light. Let me read the paraphrase of that same passage in the message, which I really like. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your youthfulness, usefulness, and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You are here to be a light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bears, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house, be generous with your lives, be opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So this passage is about influence, and influence is spiritual. Christians are to have influence in the world. We're to make a difference. Andrew Murray was a pastor and writer. He's written lots of books on prayer. Perhaps you've read one. He's influenced millions by his books, but in his life too. Five of his six sons were ministers. Four of his daughters married ministers. Ten of his grandchildren were in the ministry, and 13 grandchildren became missionaries. That's influence. Let's look at this word salt. In verse 13, it says you, which is emphatic in the Greek, you 12, and every disciple to come. Think about what Jesus is saying. You poor, humble, simple, doubting, denying men are salt of the earth. I mean, it's almost laughable. The whole earth, them, it must be an exaggeration. But it wasn't. They were. Could you and I? I think that's our charge and challenge. You are the salt. Not you should be, or you will be someday, or you must be, or you might be. You are salt. He doesn't call them honey or sugar. Some of us are too sweet. We need to have a little more bite to us. The Greeks considered salt divine, and the Romans thought that the sun and salt were the most valuable commodities. In fact, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. The Latin word salt is salarium, from which we get our word salary. You've heard it said, he's not worth his salt. Well, Jesus' audience would have understood and appreciated this metaphor. Well, let's look at a few characteristics of salt. I'm going to cover two today. First, salt stings. If you rub it in a wound, it hurts. 
Kathy's grandmother <clears throat> showed her a little thing about sniffing with salt water when you feel a coal coming on, and the salt attacks those germs. The Holy Spirit is like salt convicting of sin. <clears throat> he can use us for that. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Do you realize that you're either leading people to God or away from God by your words and actions? <clears throat> Second, salt creates thirst. Eat a bag of pretzels and you know what I mean. Does your life create thirst with anyone? Do your words make people curious or does it turn them off? Jesus created thirst in the people he encountered. Peter, Matthew, Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, blind Bartimaeus, Mary Magdalene. All kinds of different types of people were intrigued and wanted to be around Jesus. It's said that when D.L. Moody came into a room, unbelievers came under conviction and came up to him asking him what they needed to do to be saved without him even saying a word. And William Wilberforce single-handedly stopped the slave trade in England. He once gave a speech before Parliament, and James Boswell heard the speech. He described his appearance as shrimp-like. Boswell writes, When the speech began, I saw a shrimp, and when it ended, a whale. Benjamin Franklin didn't much like preachers, but rushed to hear George Whitfield. A man said, you don't believe a word he says. But Franklin told him, but he does. Are you creating thirst in anyone today? <clears throat> Is anything easy anymore? Um, walking a Sunday morning, I rounded the next corner. I was under a cherry blossom tree, and I really felt these words drop on me. I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it again. And <clears throat> what followed was almost like the volume turned up on the birds singing, <clears throat> the focus of the cherry blossoms turning on Hawks Hill, and seeing the sun just squarely rising on the middle of the street as I walked. It was evident that God was speaking, that it's easy and he knows how to gain glory for himself. And it was actually finding me out and where my state of mind was. <clears throat> so since then, there's been an expanding truth of this matter. When something comes out of the blue, I know it's meant to really alter the way I'm looking at things. because it was like nature was speaking right at my hands and God saying, I am able to draw glory from, from whatever is before me and especially the flow that is towards his son as we've been talking. <clears throat> so is there really a place of ease out there, uh, uh, accessible, reachable, powerful, holy river that we can continually draw. And I mean easy. That, that is the big word. So many things are complicated right now. I realize that, and I think the word irksome um, has fit the word that those words fell on with me. I was in a little um, just pretty much a stewing state and things are seeming irksome. You know, it's very interesting that one of the major words for evil in the New Testament, second I think, is kakos, which actually carries with it a sense of irksome and noisome. So when life and attitude is beginning to seem that way against the deception, against passwords that don't work, um, phone menus on businesses that never get you to a person, 
when it's just starting to seem that way, I think we need to realize we are missing something. Like last Sunday night, as I laid in bed in a more desperate um, state of mind because um, my mom, 500 miles away, you know, sitting in a pretty confused state with a broken hip, awaiting surgery and not familiar faces around. But what became very real to me is almost like the I am that I am is the divine is, he exists. And almost like we have organs that are very contained, but the epidermis, the skin, is an organ that spreads wide. And I received that the skin of that living organ that was present with me in Mechanicsville was present with her in Akron, Ohio. And there is an ease in that that I believe we need to get into. And I know I'm feeding off constantly right now. So a very good scripture to land on with this, and it's, I think it's right now my favorite, is Zechariah 6.13. It is he, the Messiah, who shall build the temple of the Lord, which he said, I will build my church, and shall bear the glory. And we've been talking about that. And shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. A commentator focused on the audience that Zechariah had here. If kings seem to have perished from among men, if authorities are dying out, and there are no names of power that can rally the world, I think I see that now, amid the Antarctic, Antarctic chaos of this day, when old institutions are crumbling or crashing into decay, when the whole civilized world seems slowly and painfully departing from its moorings and like some unwielding raft is creaking and straining at its chains, and this is telling, as it feels the impulse of the swift current that is bearing it to an unknown sea. Oh, isn't that true today? When venerable names cease to have power, when old truths are flouted as antiquity, and antiquated and the new ones seem so long in making their appearance when a perfect babble of voices stuns us and on every side are pretenders to the throne which they fancy vacant this is the state i know ed and i overall have been lamenting i mean we've become thinking adults for now decades and right simultaneously with this has been this moral slide as we have never seen. So here we turn to the one who in this scripture bears the glory. Benson said, glory in general is a burden. And this double glory would be a double burden for not to, but not too heavy for him to bear that upholds all things. He bore the cross which was his glory, he bears the crown, an exceeding great and eternal weight of glory. Then, and he shall bear the glory, that is of building the temple, the church. And the phrase denotes that the glory of it shall be upon him. It shall be hung upon him. Isaiah 22, 24 is really an amazing cor correlation to this. They shall hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, every small vessel from the cups to the flagons, all hung around his neck, so shall be visible that it would be weighty and heavy, he having many crowns on his head, put there by all the saints, who every one of them ascribe glory to him. He bears the glory. And at the end of that is the council of peace, which I return to often between them, concerning the peace to be made between God and man by the mediation of the Messiah, planned by infinite wisdom and the covenant of redemption that the Father and the Son understood each other perfectly. A man named Barnes interprets this, which is basically interpreting Jerome, that the council of peace should be between Jesus and the Father. As Jerome says, 
There shall be a peaceful counsel between the two, referred to the Father and the Son, because he came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. The Father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father. In Christ is all perfect harmony. There is a counsel of peace between him and the Father, whose <laughs> temple he builds. The will of the Father and the Son is one. Both had one will of love toward us, the salvation of the world, bringing forth peace through our redemption. So this verse introduces an ease and effortlessness that we can enter into. And I, I don't think those are light words to use. It could sound like we're trying to be lazy and nothing's lazy in this. But by God's graces, I think he knows it's a necessity for us to have something accessible in order to function. Just like it was effortless for God to set his place of rest upon Jesus which we think of as on Zion in Psalms 132. He will see to it no matter what. As I told our um, daughter-in-law, I think she's tiny framed and is very hard worker. The baby will take first what the baby needs. In a similar way, God is gonna make sure that the glory goes to the son first. So listen to this, if you will. John 8, 50, yet I do not seek my own glory, Jesus says. There is one who seeks it, and he is judge. Another translation says he demands it. So can we catch this? He is judge. As James is saying, he is standing by the door, and yet what he's all about is seeking the glory of his son, almost like what we shared before, perhaps they will reverence my son. He is all in this towards the son. Can we imagine the constancy, the unchangeableness, the unconditional of this source and resource, what remains effortless for ourselves? Please, let's get to this side of glory going to Jesus the wellspring of the most effortless flow of the universe, father to son. You know, related to this last week, almost could think this is part two, convinced that the movement and glory is fully going in that end, but adding on this point that we need today, it is effortless. We desperately need to join the effortless. So can we imagine this in resurrection life? Eye to eye, counsel of peace, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works I do and greater works will he do than these because I'm going to the Father. And I always hear people hung up on, what are those greater works? What can we do? But wouldn't it be almost more beneficial to focus that Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father. There's going to be such joy in this. If you loved me, John 14, 28, you would rejoice because I'm going to the Father. What perfect harmony and greatest joy, like the song, I knew our joy would fill the earth and last till the end of time. And if you could bear with this, you know, this exchange with father and son and what's between them that we're invited into reminds me a little bit of waving walkers and waving motorists in Mechanicsville. It's such a low level interaction but it still involves initiation and response. And there's something that happens with that. Motorist waves, I respond. I spawn, I wave, motorist responds. I pray, we wave, he waves back. The son of God asks, the son of God receives. It's as smooth as that. Again, we need a place where it is smooth and fulfilled. Jesus said in John 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will do that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It is so desirable for God to be glorified in the Son. All the rush that we are looking for is going towards that. Focus our attention always there. So the Son says, I will do it. Okay, so when we pray, do we expect change? 
Because if the son says, I will do it, it's almost as if I'm going to get out of the chair and I'm going to do it. A change is going to happen. We, I think we need to realize that he will do it for the Father. I will do it for the Father to be glorified in me because we are using my name as if I was asking and we have a council of peace between us and we see eye to eye and we are one and all authority is given to me and nothing is higher than me. This will I do. Glorified in the Son in prayer is a part of our continuing worship. So ease is less and less accessible. I think we all know that. And as I listed a few things before, if you just let yourself stay dormant in a day, the needs will suck you up. They will swallow you up. We really need to make a continual stand on this. If I knew there's a place of ease so accessible that is righteous and powerful, I want it. The Father to the Son is the smoothest, steadiest, strongest operation in the universe, and we could be held up, we can be held up by that each day of our existence. Find the flood, find the airspace. He is has glorified his name, he will glorify it again. But where does he continue to glorify it? I think we're hearing that. Here we lift our heads and rejoice that in the midst of tyranny and anarchy of sovereignties whose ultimate resort is force, there is another kingdom, the most absolute of despotisms and yet the most perfect democracy whose law is love. And I'm going to end with something that might seem a little stretch for this, but, you know, these are our words that are being shared. I mean, maybe taken in, but will they really change Will they really alter us? There is a sweet story a local woman named Kay told my husband a few weeks ago. On her first day of um, breast cancer treatment, she dutifully went to the local hospital, got registered, and at 6 p.m., she still sat there unattended. So her son came, and he was angry, and he... Um, address the staff angrily but then he came up to her he's like how can you let this happen how could you let this happen and all day she looked down at the registration paper that said patient k jones that resonated in her there was a truth in that she allowed that to embrace her it, it held her through maybe the most vulnerable day of her life hour after hour so as Kay could be held through a day like that, can we be held through a lifetime by looking at our identity? Perhaps we can say, this is my identity. A child caught in the joyful ease between the father and the son, never to be removed. Thank you, Father, for this day. I pray that you might be glorified and receive glory through the lives of your people today, being salt and light in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you have a blessed day.